Hey folks, Ryan here and welcome back to another episode of The Reading Room. This week we're going to be taking a look at a dog who was hit by a car. It's that classic case that we've all seen in practice and let's jump in to take a look at the radiographs. So this time it's a one-year-old male castrated Labrador Retriever who's presenting to our clinic to Kipnik following trauma and that trauma of course as we said being hit by a car. So these are the radiographs we have. We have a dorsal ventral projection on the left hand side of our screen, a left lateral projection on the right hand side of our screen, and of course we always take three view projections of the thorax so we've got our right lateral projection as well. So let's start with the dorsal ventral and the left lateral projection. The main findings here are intrathoracic. So it's going to be really important for us to look at the whole images but let's start from an inside out approach. When we look at the cardiac silhouette, it's not fully visible in all projections, but I feel confident enough saying it's a normal size. And the reason that I feel confident with that is that in the lateral projection, we've got normal positioning of the carina, so it's not dorsally deviated, which would indicate to me cardiomegaly. So that's a normal position, so we think probably the heart is of a normal size. And then in the dorsoventral projection, even though there's some border effacement or silhouetting with this left aspect of the cardiac silhouette, I can still see portions of it and enough of it to say, hey, this heart is okay, and so we're not too worried about the cardiac silhouette. The pulmonary vessels that I can see similarly, they're all right. But once we get a little bit further out into our lungs, that's where we start to see some problems. The best place to see that is in this dorsoventral projection where all the lung lobes on the left hand side, so the left cranial, both the cranial segment and the caudal segment, as well as the left caudal lung lobe have an increase in opacity. And those increases in opacity are forming air bronchograms. We can see that there is no vessel margins, especially in this caudal subsegment of the left cranial and cranial subsegment of the left cranial. We don't see any vessels and we see these nice air filled bronchi. Those are our air bronchograms. So we know that there has to be an alveolar pattern. And of course, when we look at our left lateral projection, that finding is not as visible because this is the dependent lung. And so atelectasis is preventing us from seeing it. So when we go over to our contralateral view, our right lateral projection, we can again see those air bronchograms highlighted really nicely sitting over top of our cardiac silhouette and that more uniform increase in pulmonary opacity. This view is also great for picking up a couple other findings in the lungs. One is that we've got an increase in opacity cotodorsally. So this is likely that left caudal lung lobe, which is partially affected as well. And this would be more of an interstitial pattern because we can still see our vessels within that lobe. So it's not fully an alveolar pattern. But then within the thorax, we have also some gas in the pleural space. So I see that gas present cranioventrally, this pocket of gas here, which doesn't look like it's contained within lung. And then cotodorsally, this margin of the lung is retracted from the body wall. So normally the lungs kind of sit over top of each other and will extend all the way back along the margins. But in this case, I've got some gas in the pleural space, which is causing retraction of the lung lobes. If we jump back to our previous projection, we can see that as well. We've got these lucencies present within the dorsal thorax here. These are gas bubbles in the pleural space. And we can also see that lung margin here. This is an indication of a pneumothorax. So whenever we see a pneumothorax, it's really important to look for a reason why. And a common cause of a reason why in a dog that's hit by a car would of course be a rib fracture. So whenever we're evaluating our thorax, again, systematic approaches, evaluating everything, but really obviously focusing in on things that we know go together. So whenever I see a pneumothorax, I want to be sure to evaluate those ribs extra, extra careful. In this instance, I don't see a rib fracture. When I'm evaluating ribs, I look at them in both dorsoventral and lateral projections. I follow along the margins of each rib, and I don't see a single rib that has a fracture in it along either side of the thorax and nothing in the lateral projections. But 
as I'm doing that systematic approach and I'm going through each piece, we looked at the heart, we looked at the lungs, we looked at the pleural space. I did look at the mediastinum. We didn't talk about it much, but there's not a lot going on there. We're moving further outside and we get to these skeletal structures, nothing in the ribs. But as I'm tracing along the vertebral column, I notice that there is an abnormality here. And this is super important because we can get distracted by those big abnormalities intrathoracically and lose focus on those really vital pieces that are near the edge of our image. So here we actually have a fracture of the caudal end plate of T11 and a luxation between T11 and 12. We can see that the T12 vertebra is ventrally displaced relative to T11. And so this is a really important finding for this dog. It's going to really dictate how this case is going to progress. So when we think about our findings, we've got our pneumothorax, we've got our alveolar pattern craniventrally and a little bit of an interstitial pattern more cotodorsally. And then we've got that T11 fracture and luxation. So this was a patient that actually was able to undergo medical management for all of these problems. So this is a few days later and we can already see that the pneumothorax is essentially resolved. We don't have a lot of gas left in the pleural space. We still got a little bit sitting um, dorsally here, but that retraction of the lung lobe that we saw previously, we're not seeing anymore. And there still is that alveolar pattern in the left lung lobes but we're not seeing as much increase in opacity cotodorsally uh, as we were previously. So we've got some improvement in our pulmonary pattern. And then of course we still have our fracture and luxation of T11, but the patient can undergo medical management for that. So this is, you know, that's not going to be the case in every case with a spinal fracture, but luckily for this dog, it was. And this alveolar pattern in the lung was a pulmonary contusion or a bruise, a little bit of bleeding into the lung there that uh, also resolved over time. And so this dog went on to do quite well. So that's kind of a summary of this case. It has a lot of findings, but the real important piece that I want to touch on, of course, is this idea of satisfaction of search. So that's where we get distracted by finding the main finding. In this case, we could think about that as our pulmonary pattern or our intrathoracic findings, and we forget about those extra findings. And that's where a systematic approach to radiographs helps us out so, so much. And of course, three view radiographs. If we were only looking at two views or only lateral views, you know, we would have a lot of problems in identifying everything that's going on in this thorax. And so it's really important to get three view radiographs when we are evaluating our patients. So wrapping it up one more time, we've got a patient who was hit by a car, unfortunately had this spinal fracture and luxation, which was really important to evaluate with a systematic approach to be able to catch that on these radiographs. And then we've got our pulmonary contusions, which we monitor over time with radiographs and they're slowly getting better. So I hope that helps the next time you have a patient that comes in hit by a car and we'll see you next time on the reading room.